we've got a tremendous character of faith and zeal to consider this evening, God willing, in this man Phinehas. Zeal or zealous are going to be key words in our study this evening. And we need to take a lesson to ourselves regarding zeal and being zealous. Now I think there are three characters named Phinehas in the Bible. So for clarification, can we firstly turn to Exodus chapter 6, uh, where we have the very first mention of Phinehas in the Bible. And it's the character that we want to look at this evening. So this is Exodus chapter 6, the very first mention of Phinehas we find in verse 25. And Eleazar, Aaron's son, took him, one of the daughters of Putiel, to wife, and she bare him Phinehas. So we're going to be considering Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, who was the grandson of Aaron, Israel's first high priest. Whilst we're looking at this verse here, uh, I just want us to notice something for later on. And that is that Phinehas's mother's name is not mentioned here. In fact, it's not mentioned anywhere in scripture. Now that's a little bit strange because back in verse 23... We are actually given the name of his grandmother, that was Eli Sheba. And then even back in verse 20, we have the name of his great-grandmother, that was Jochebed. But there's no mention of his mother's name. And I'm going to suggest that there might be a reason for that, which we'll consider later on. So, Phinehas uh, must have been quite a young lad at the time of the exodus from Egypt. We have a young, impressionable lad in his formative years, and all around him he is observing things going on, and he's uh, witnessing the power of Almighty God in those ten plagues that came upon Egypt and then as they came out of Egypt the parting of the Red Sea uh, the giving of manna every day water coming out of that rock so lots of miracles going on that this young lad was observing as he grew up and then contrast that with something else that he would have observed and that was the murmuring of the generation all about him. Can we have a look at Numbers chapter 21 please? In Numbers chapter 21 we have the children of Israel chiding with Moses and as a result of that a plague comes upon them. So this is Numbers 21 and verse 5 we see them uh, speaking out against Moses and as a result of their murmurings, we read this in verse 6. And Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Now we know what stopped this plague in its tracks. We're told it in verse 9. Moses made a brazen serpent, and whoso looked upon it in faith, was saved from, the, from death, from the plague. And we know that that serpent points forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, who also was lifted up upon a pole, bearing our brassy nature of sin's flesh. And the serpent upon the pole also must have been observed by Phinehas. And he was learning lessons all the time. Now, what does Phinehas' name mean? <clears throat> well, depending on what reference you go to, what concordance you might use, there are several alternatives, but the two that particularly struck me were mouth of brass or mouth of a serpent. Well, that's appropriate when we 
remember that plague that's just occurred because of their murmuring. Because Phineas had just observed the staying of that plague through faith of those that looked upon the brassy serpent. And his name means mouth of brass or mouth of a serpent. Now, Phinehas was going to be the one through whom the next plague was going to be stayed. He was destined for that role. Well, we say destined to be the one who would stay that plague, albeit Phinehas wasn't in the immediate line of descent from Aaron to take on the role of high priest. It was, in fact, quite unlikely that he would ever become high priest because he had two older uncles who were of nearer kin uh, than was he. Can we go back to Numbers chapter 3? Those two uncles were Nadab and Abihu. And we may remember what happened to them, but we'll remind ourselves in Numbers chapter 3 and verse 2. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So we see that Eleazar there seems to be third in line to succeed um, Aaron uh, upon his demise. So the likelihood of Phinehas, Eleazar's son, ever taking on the role of high priest was therefore quite slim. But what happens in verse 4? Nadab and Abihu died before Yahweh when they offered strange fire. They wanted to worship God on their terms and for that they perished. And that was all observed again by Phinehas. Now, by natural descent, Nadab and Abihu's own children should then have been successors to Aaron. But if we read on in verse 4, we see there was a problem there. And they, this is Nadab and Abihu, had no children. And so that line was broken. And so, totally unexpectedly, Eleazar becomes the high priest elect and then Phinehas would be next in line to him in process of time. And so divine providence thrusts this young man into a position of awesome responsibility in prospect. Now, um, can we go to the first of Chronicles, please? Uh, firstly, chapter 6. And, and uh, obviously we're, we're jumping forward in time now, but in First of Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 4, we actually read that in process of time, Phinehas had a son of his own. So this is First Chronicles 6 verse 4, Eleazar begat Phinehas, and Phinehas begat Abishua. But again, can we just make a note that there's no name here given for Phinehas' wife. It's, it's almost as if those nearest and dearest to him have no identity. His mother's not named, and even his wife is not named. So we'll, we'll think about that again later on. Can we come over to chapter 9 now, please? First Chronicles chapter 9. And I want us to consider what Phineas's role was uh, in his priestly service. So, so we, we've, we're moving now towards the end of the wilderness wanderings. They were in the wilderness, we know, for 40 years. And that time is, is coming towards an end now. So Phineas has matured. And he's also taken up a priestly service. Uh, so I want to read First Chronicles chapter 9 from verse 19. 
Uh, Shalom, the son of Korah, the son of Abiasaph, the son of Korah, and his brethren of the house of his father, the Kor- Korahites, were over the work of the service. And notice this, please. Keepers of the gates of the tabernacle. And their fathers, being over the host of Yahweh, were keepers of the entry. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, was ruler over them in time past. And Yahweh was with him. And Zechariah, the son of Meshelamiah, was porter of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. All these which were chosen to be porters in the gates were 212. So do you see the recurrence of of words like uh, uh, the gates, the entry, um, the entrance to the tabernacle? And Phinehas, verse 20, was ruler over those who were in charge of the entry of the tabernacle. Um, so, with that in mind, can we come back to Numbers chapter 25, which we, we read together, that uh, infamous uh, incident that forced Phinehas to take swift and decisive action What a responsibility to have the charge of all that went on around the door of the tabernacle. What happened there? Who was permitted to go in? Who would come out? At the very focal point of the whole encampment of Israel. That was the role of Phinehas. Now, Let's pause for a little bit of exhortation, brethren and sisters. How do we treat the role of doorkeeper in our ecclesias? Do we treat it lightly? Do we view it as a rather insignificant role in the ecclesia? Well, we shouldn't. The doorkeeper helps everything to be done decently and in order. Yes, But in exceptional circumstances, it's the doorkeeper who might have to refuse entry so that the rest of the ecclesia can meet in harmony and true fellowship. Now hopefully those situations are very few and far between. But if and when they occur, that entrance needs to be overseen by someone mature enough and spiritually discerning enough to spot potential problems before they occur. It's actually a a role of very great responsibility requiring spiritual wisdom. So, back to Phinehas. We're coming to the key incident in his life which I suggest marked him out for the rest of his life. Indeed, I believe for eternity. Uh, The incident recorded in chapter 25 here. Now, as we say, I think now we're coming towards the end of the 40 years in the wilderness when when we get to chapter 25. Aaron has died. Eliezer is now the high priest. Uh, and if that means that uh, Phinehas was the high priest elect. Uh, and Israel, we find them uh, dwelling at the start of the chapter in Shittim. And you, you may recall it's from Shittim that Joshua sent out the two spies to go and look at Jericho. So they're, they're almost at the end of the journey, the wilderness journey. Um, So in Numbers 25, uh, this young man Phinehas has now matured and I would imagine he'd probably be uh, in his 50s, somewhere around there. Um, Incidentally, right at the end of Numbers chapter 26, almost the very last line of Numbers 26, 
we're reminded that of the generation that came out of Egypt, only Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land, along with the new generation, those who were less than 20 years old at the time of the Exodus. Well, I don't actually believe that's strictly true. Uh, and I think it's Eliezer, Phinehas's father, that proves the point. Because back in Numbers chapter 3 and verse 4, which we've already looked at, after the death of Nadab and Abihu, Eliezer, we're told, ministered in the priest's office. But to qualify to minister in the priest's office, a Levite had to be over 30 years of age. The generation destined to die in the wilderness were all those from 20 years old and above. We're told that in Numbers 14, verse 29. So Eliezer should have been amongst those that died in the wilderness. But he didn't. He survived to go into the promised land, even as the high priest. Why? Why did he? Well, when the 12 spies were sent out at the beginning of the wilderness wanderings, to go and spy out the land, the tribe of Levi weren't involved in those 12 that went in. Didn't involve anyone from the tribe of Levi. Uh, so they didn't come back with an evil report. That's the point. Uh, also, in the census, in Numbers chapter 1, of all those 20 years and over, the Levites were specifically excluded from that numbering. you find that in Numbers chapter 1 verse 47. So consequently, I believe that Joshua and Caleb were accompanied into the land of promise by the whole tribe of Levi plus the new generation from the other tribes. Well... Be that, be that as it may, let's, let's look at this chapter 25 now. Numbers 25. I don't want to dwell on the abominations that were going on here. They are depraved and they are sordid for any nation. That would be bad enough. But this was going on amongst God's firstborn sons. So we're in a... We've, we've got dreadful things going on in this chapter. Um, and they were undertaking these acts with the daughters of Moab. And doesn't that remind you of Genesis chapter 6? The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And we know that on that occasion God sent the flood to destroy all flesh. And death was now the punishment for all involved in this incident too. Verse 4, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And this slaughter of the guilty ones is called, in verse 9, a plague. A plague in which 24,000 perished. And the most obnoxious incident of all is found in verse 6. Where fornication was blatantly and even proudly performed by one named Zimri. A prince, no less, of a chief house among the Simeonites. Verse 14 tells us that. Openly and brazenly... And as we read verse 6 now, I want us to notice where it happened. Verse 6, Numbers 25, Behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So this abomination was perpetrated before the door of the tabernacle 
of the congregation in flagrant dismissal of the holiness of that place. And who was it who was ruler over the doorkeepers of the tabernacle? Well, it was Phineas. Verse 7. And when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, he went in after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And we might ask, well, why Phinehas? Where, where was Moses in all of this? Um, and where was Joshua? And where was Eliezer? Why was it Phinehas who acted so resolutely here? Where were his elders? And I think it boils down to his zeal. Whilst others may perhaps have hesitated or deliberated, Phinehas acted. Phinehas, who as high priest elect would defile himself through contact with the dead, was willing to risk that in order to rid Israel of this wickedness. And it was also his duty as head doorkeeper to preserve the way and the purity of the way. And so he destroyed this wicked pair in the very act. And through that decisive action, the plague was stayed. Remember the plague of serpent bites was stayed when they looked upon the brazen serpent. And this plague, the plague of what became known as Baal Peor, was stayed through the one whose name can mean mouth of brass or mouth of a serpent. And now for his righteous act, verse 10 of this chapter provides us with the divine estimation of this man. Let's go in at verse 11. No, verse 10. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, and made atonement for the children of Israel. So notice in verse 11 that the quality of Phinehas' character that was noteworthy before the Almighty was that he was zealous. And to make doubly sure that we notice it, it's repeated in verse 13. He was zealous. And not only that, but the very next phrase uh, in verse uh, 11, towards the end of verse 11, that little phrase, for my sake, um, if you have an authorised version margin, you'll see it gives an alternative with my zeal. So God is confirming that Phinehas dealt with this situation just as he himself would have done. It was with the lightness of his heavenly father's zeal that Phinehas acted. Not only that, but at the end of the verse, it ends with the same phrase, because in my jealousy is the same word as zeal, translated elsewhere there. Uh, so perhaps it should end that verse, in my zeal. Wherefore, verse 12, and now comes Phinehas' reward for his action. Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. And we need to think about that for a little while. And ultimately, in these promises to Phinehas, we surely have in view the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I'm sure Phinehas is a type of Christ here in the way he acts 
and puts away abomination. Um, yeah, can we go to Malachi chapter 2, please? Uh, thinking of this promise of a, a covenant of peace, keeping that in our minds. Who is it, who is in the prophet's mind as he pens Malachi chapter 2 and we'll go in at verse 4. Malachi 2 verse 4. Ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you that my covenant might be with Levi. Phinehas was of the tribe of Levi. My covenant was with him of life and peace. And he's just been promised a covenant of peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. That's reverential fear. Uh, the law of truth was in his mouth. Now, who's this speaking of? It must, it must have reference to Christ, mustn't it? Iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. So I think there we can see Phinehas involved, uh, but also it's, it's prophetic of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also prophetically, Isaiah 53, we know it's messianic, but I wonder if we see echoes of Phinehas there, because we read, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. And coming back to Numbers chapter 25 and verse 13, that Phinehas is promised that he shall have it, the covenant of peace, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. So what incredible and marvellous things were promised to Phinehas by the Almighty. And, and they, they speak of things eternal. Uh, and intimated in these promises, I believe, is a, a foreshadowing of the change of priesthood. Phinehas, we know, was in the natural line of Aaron. But can we have a look at Hebrews chapter 7, please? Here, the writer is reminding us, or introduces us, to Melchizedek. King of Salem, priest of the Most High God. So he was a king priest. Uh, and note the end of verse 3. Uh, made like unto the Son of God, he abideth a priest continually, continually, and Phinehas has just been promised an everlasting priesthood. And then look at verse 23. And they truly were many priests, this is the Aaronic ones, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. The Aaronic priesthood was ever-changing because as one died, another took the office. It needed a, su a succession of generations to carry it on. But now let's read verse 24 with those promises to Phinehas in our minds but this man speaking of Christ but just think of Phinehas but this man because he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood a priest forever after the order not of Aaron but now of Melchizedek the king priestly uh, aspect which will be introduced in the kingdom age. Now just add to that the fact that we noted earlier that the mother of Phinehas was not named uh, and even his wife was not named. So just go back to verse 3 because we read there that Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life. And 
there's no record of Melchizedek's parentage, his birth or his death. Now, yes, we know Phinehas's father's name. We had to know that to appreciate that he was, naturally speaking, in the line of Aaron. But he's now promised the everlasting priesthood of Melchizedek. And we don't know his mother's name, we don't know his wife's name, and his death is not recorded either. Now, I'm not saying that Phinehas was Melchizedek, not at all. But there are similarities between uh, Phinehas, the life of Phinehas, and the uh, everlasting priesthood of Melchizedek. Can we um, have a look at Psalm 106, please? And Phinehas is uh, recorded in Psalm 106 so that his action is never forgotten. Psalm 106, verse 28. They joined themselves, the children of Israel, unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked God to anger with their inventions and the plague break in upon them. Then stood up Phinehas and executed judgment, and so the plague was stayed. And now notice this, verse 31. That was counted unto him for righteousness, unto all generations for evermore. So there's the eternal aspect of the promise, once again, unto all generations for evermore. But look at that phrase in verse 31, um, which the, the divine record says of Phinehas. That was counted unto him for righteousness. Now there's only one other character in the whole of scripture of whom that said. Let's have a look at Romans chapter 4. And Romans chapter 4 is all about a faithful seed which begins in verse 3 with Abraham. Romans chapter 4 verse 3 For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And the only other person in scripture to whom that is said was Phinehas. So how highly esteemed this man was reckoned uh, by the Almighty. And remember the blessing conferred upon Phinehas was not just for him, but also for his seed after him. And Romans 4 is all about the seed, whether circumcised or uncircumcised. In other words, Jew or Gentile. Um, have a look at verse 11. Of Romans, He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, and so on. And so we in these far off days can be related to the promises to Abraham and the blessings to Phinehas if we also show faith and zeal in our lives. But, uh, there's always a but, isn't there? Um, all men have their faults, including Phinehas. Uh, and zeal can be misplaced, can't it? And we think of the Apostle Paul, for example, who uh, persecuted the early ecclesia, and he did it zealously. Uh, in Philippians, he admits it. He reflects on his past, saying, concerning zeal, persecuting the ecclesia. So zeal can be misplaced. The trick is to apply zeal to our lives in the truth, in the ecclesia. But we can all, all, all too easily apply zeal um, to wrong things. And I want us to consider a, another incident involving Phinehas now. Um, can we turn to Joshua chapter 22 please?
uh, and this is where we see zeal misapplied. So, just to give the background of Joshua <coughs> 22, this is the uh, incident. Having conquered the land of promise, uh, Joshua calls to him those two and a half tribes who wanted their inheritance on the east side of the River Jordan. Reuben, Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh um, had promised that they would help to clear the land of the Canaanites with the other tribes if after that they could return to their allocation across the river. And in Joshua chapter 22, that time had now come. And verse 4 confirms it for us. Uh, Joshua 22 verse 4. Now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren as he promised them. Therefore now return ye, the two and a half tribes, get you to your tents and unto the land of your possession, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side Jordan. So that's the situation in chapter 22. Now a potential problem uh, arose when on their journey back to their land, the two and a half tribes decide to build an altar. Uh, verse 10. And when they came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. And that little phrase, a great altar to see to, means a phenomenon, a spectacle, something to look up to. That's the idea at the end of that verse. Whatever this altar looked like, um, it sounds like a lot of effort went into its construction and it was something substantial to be looked up to. Now, word of its erection came back to the other nine and a half tribes who were incensed at this perceived idol worship. And Israel were put on course for a potential civil war. Verse 11. The children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad and the half tribe have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. War was in the offing. Now who was it who was to lead the nine and a half tribes on a war footing against the two and a half tribes. Verse 13. The children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and to the half tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest. And with him, ten princes of each chief house, a prince throughout all the tribes of Israel, and each one was a head of the house of their fathers, among the thousands of Israel. So it was Phinehas who was to lead the army on this awkward and dangerous venture as the nine and a half tribes come before the two and a half and confront them. And although you'll notice verse 16 begins, thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, I'm feel pretty confident that the mouthpiece would have been Phinehas. And I think that is reasonably confirmed when we consider verse 17. Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, from which we are not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord? And in the mind of Phinehas, he's gone right back to Baal Peor. And the plague that he stayed through his righteous act with the, with the javelin. So that seems to uh, imply to me that it was Phinehas who was speaking here. Um, I think that's fairly certain. 
Surely idol worship at this altar would cause another deadly plague to come upon the congregation. That was Phinehas's reasoning. Now we notice that the nine and a half tribes under Phinehas' leadership speak to the two and a half tribes. There is zeal here. They must have their say first, giving no opportunity to the two and a half tribes to get the upper hand. And Phinehas goes straight in with a discourse that we read from verse 16 right through to the end of verse 20, rehearsing other events from Israel's history which ought to have made the two and a half tribes appreciate uh, Almighty God and the wrath that would come upon them if they rebelled. So yes, here's Phinehas manifesting his zeal once again. Unfortunately, he had gone headlong into this oration, assuming their guilt and giving those two and a half tribes no chance at all to offer an explanation of their actions. In fact, I think the, the two and a half tribes are, are commendable for their own patience here. And I think it shows a respect for Phinehas that they don't interrupt him. They knew his history. They would have known those promises that were given to him uh, earlier on. But they knew his standing and his authority. And they let him continue his oration in a polite silence. Only when Phineas had finished his discourse did the two and a half tribes speak in verse 21. Then they replied. And then they explained that the intention of the altar was not to offer sacrifice on at all. And it was not intended to be an alternative place of worship, but rather a memorial stone. Um, verse 26. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us, and so on. Uh, and this reasoning was found to be acceptable and thus appeased and probably somewhat humbled Phinehas and the nine and a half tribes back down. Uh, verse 30. And when Phinehas the priest and the princes of the congregation and the heads of the thousands of Israel which were with him heard the words that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spake, it pleased them. My margin says it was good in their eyes. Phinehas had been overzealous and presumptuous on this occasion. But doesn't the fact that he had his faults give us hope, brethren, sisters, young people? Even this great man who received those wonderful blessings and promises from Yahweh, who appeared to be likened unto Abraham, who showed courage and zeal in his life. Even he had his faults. No one is perfect. All have come short of the example set by our master. So thanks be to our heavenly father who is pleased to mark out our good attributes and put our bad ones behind his back if we are motivated by the scriptures of truth. Uh, one question remains. When is it right to wield the javelin in contrast to listening to those who may be acting contrary to the way of truth? These are two extremes, aren't they, that emerge from these two key incidents in Phineas' life. He was right to wield the javelin in the incident of Baal Peor, but he should have listened at the incident of the altar named Ed. And we can all probably think of instances in our own lives, in the truth, in the ecclesia, 
where it has been right and proper to take decisive action, but also where it's been right and proper to stand back and listen in patience. And to get that balance right can be extremely challenging and difficult and worrying for those who have the oversight of an ecclesia. And of course, things are not always black and white, are they? And there may be incidents that we come across in ecclesial life that have to be dealt with for the good of the body, but on a sliding scale of wielding the javelin to simply leaving things be, many brethren and sisters in, in, in a, a single ecclesia might have a different view. What are we to do? Well, we must firstly approach our Heavenly Father in prayer and seek for wisdom and guidance in these situations. And then we can look to the scriptures for examples of heroes of faith, such as the one we've looked at this evening, to see and to learn from how they reacted. We won't always get it right. We are weak and erring flesh. But if all our actions, and sometimes inactions, are faithfully undertaken, we, by God's grace and mercy, will also receive that everlasting priesthood in the age to come, by God's grace. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to kill and a time to heal. And we think of those two key incidents in the life of Phinehas. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. And I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. May we all be counted as the seed of Abraham and of Phinehas in the day of our master's appearing, so that each one of us might receive that same covenant of peace promised to that faithful man of zeal.